Yeah. You're welcome back. This is News File, it's your most authoritative news analysis platform. And as you know, here on News File, we put Ghana first. My guest's next panel um, to continue the discussion and to look at the other aspects of the development in our attempts to, uh, in our fight to contain coronavirus. <coughs> Osei Bunsu Dixon, to my right. He is Chief Legal Advisor, National Security Council Secretariat, and Director for Media and Communications, Government Operation COVID Safety. Thank you very much for making time to join us. Thank you, Samson. Right. Also here is Kofi Abochi, Immediate Past Dean, Gimpa School of Law. Um, on the phone, we will be joined by, or we are joined by Professor Peter Corte, Professor of Economics and Director, Institute of Statistical, Social and Economic Research, ESA, of the University of Ghana. Prof, thank you very much for making time. My pleasure. Okay, we also have Dr. Kwesi Enin, um, Director, Faculty of Academic Affairs and Research, Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training center thank you so very much so um first from the national security perspective this is the time that you are doing a lot of your work not sitting by your desk but having to go interface with the populace and try to ensure that people are complying uh, among other things how has it been so far in your work seeking to ensure that everybody is compliant? OK, so Samson, thank mm. you so much for having me here. Mm. And um, I would say that, well, we began, how do you call it, planning for this right after the president um, laid certain directives to the security intelligence agencies to plan for an operation such as this, the one that we have, the operation uh, COVID safety. And so we've, what we've done to um, effect it is to mobilize largely the um, security intelligence, the apparatus that we have for like defense, we've also for customs, immigration, uh, food and drugs board, standards board, and so on and so forth into one cohesive whole. And then to design for the um, operation um, certain parameters and certain things which should be achieved within the operational time. I mean, bear in mind that the entire operation is characterized by the fact that this is largely a quest to uh, constrain an infectious outbreak. Mm. And so it's not actually security, it's actually about a quest. And security is just an agent to be able to bring that, um, that disease or the infection mm. under reasonable control. Mm. And you have a wealth of knowledge, particularly in security law. And, um, and by the way, he's the author of this book, Dixon on Principles of Security Law, uh, Text Cases and Materials, Law for Security and Intelligence Professionals. Now, where, where do you place security in such a national operation? So as I said before, it's important that we are able to achieve certain objectives. I mean, if you look at what your uh, the previous speakers on this, uh, uh, I mean, in, in this particular forum have said, mm -hmm. we wanted to ensure that there was contact tracing. We wanted to ensure an environment safe and secure for that um, undertaking to be had. Mm -hmm. We also wanted to be able to quarantine people properly and ensure that they are in safe custody. Not only are they in safe custody, but they are cared for well, treated well, and then we get the numbers. Mm. And so the whole effort has been to then align the security service with a medical um, or a bi-security um, objective. So mainly, it's, that is what is likely to characterize our, our focus. Right. How do we get um, the national security apparatus comprised mm. of all these elements rights and the control and mm. in support of the medical operation. Right. Mm -hmm. And as you know, uh, civil society, the private sector is also actively engaged in helping this particular fight. I've seen uh, 
Mr. Kofi Abuchi, for example, record in his native language um, a message on education to people to understand so they can, you know, prevent uh, getting the disease. So everybody is playing their role. Um, so far, looking at the measured lockdown and how things have pan out, what, what is your assessment? And how should we look at things going forward? Well, I think, first of all, it's important for us to uh, understand the fact that we are in abnormal times. Mm. And because we are in abnormal times, uh, there's a need for you know, some extraordinary um, interventions. I think in that respect, the actions taken by the government are both measured and timely. They are measured because they take into account the socio-economic and political configuration of our country and the need for uh, interventions to reflect the circumstances of our time and the circumstances of our country. This is a global thing, mm -hmm. and there's a danger that sometimes uh, we may take actions that are not necessarily in sync with our country, but that reflects what has been done elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And so I think in that respect, there has been um, the attempt to contextualize the circumstances of our country. And so the partial lockdown reflects the circumstances of our country and reflects the economic circumstances of people. I think even that, people are still struggling. Mm -hmm. And again, the consequential action of, of, of governments and of all concerned to try and um, assuage and to try and minimize the impact of the effect of the, lo of the lockdown also reflects those uh, difficult circumstances. I think that the measures are therefore um, within proportion. And they are within proportion, and the review is as important. I, I think I need to commend the regular updates. You know, we seem to have. I think the president has given probably more speeches mm -hmm. to us than mm -hmm. if you put all that together, probably than the four years um, he's speaking regularly. Mm -hmm. And that again reflects the emergency of the time, the fact that there's a need for us to have leadership, the fact that there's a need for us to see leadership. Leadership is not only in substance, but it's also in perception. And so the fact that perceptually we have our leadership up, up and doing, and we see our leadership speaking regularly, and as it were, leading us in this fight, you know, it's been called a war. And so we are all, uh, we are all fighting a battle. Uh, the fact that I sit here today and I'm struggling to speak in you know, a mask, and that keeps, <laughs> that keeps attaching to my, my lip any time I yes. in and I speak out, you know. It, and it, you are tempted to adjust it, to then right. advise, you yeah. shouldn't right. attach right. it, you know, and you know, it's difficult. It, 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 we, we live in difficult times. Yeah. We live in difficult I saw times, the doctors so. seated, seated here, and they were all touching it and readjusting it, and I said, okay, we are told not to touch it, and I'm also <laughs> trying to avoid it, but I can't. We live in difficult times. <laughs> I have to be honest, yeah. um, you know, I had, I had a bit of a conversation with your producer when he was trying to get me on the show I was very reluctant mm -hmm. you know today is the most reluctant time mm -hmm. you know most reluctant yeah. moment for yeah. me being on the show yeah and I had to eventually do it because you know to forgot a country we right. have to all play a role like you said right. but <coughs> the fact that we have a disease that is evolving the fact that we have a disease the medical experts don't even seem to know much about mm -hmm. and they are learning by the day and mm -hmm. every day we come out and we're informed that the transmission process uh, is actually wider than was thought mm -hmm. nobody wants to take any chance so to speak. So I think my, my, my remarks are basically just to say that the, sec the leadership that has been shown in this respect appears appreciable All right. and things are in a flux <laughs> so we can just all hope that things continue uh, up and doing. I'll get to Professor Corte so that we'll get to see the uh, financial implications of what is going on and we have also been hinted that the economy is likely to go into a recession. Um, depending on how long this stays and government has to continue to be a sort of uh, a Santa Claus to give out uh, what it is doing presently. But before we go to Professor Takorte, uh, because we have mentioned questions of security and law enforcement, let me have Colonel Festus Abouadji, uh retired, who is also author of Conflict Analysis and member Council on Foreign Relations Ghana. Um, thank you for your time. Um, Thank you. Right. So, so we we understand. The last time you had some concerns, very genuine concerns about how the enforcement will be done. What do you say at this point? We have done two weeks. Okay. 
I think the, the first broad statement I would like to make is that on the whole, the treaty forces done well. The incident expect have been minimal. There are reasons and explanations for that. But they have been faced with a challenge. That challenge is the cooperation of the citizens, especially communities, you know, which would not necessarily necessitate the Swedish forces coming down very hard on them. Part of the challenge has also been the organization behind some of the social interventions. And I think in the first segment you showed how, you know, the, the crowd was not so well organized. They were not controlled. The distribution itself was very hard. In itself, inducing, you know, that behavior from the crowd. And I think I could only see one police officer to my right of that crowd. So it looks like the security forces have been challenged in terms of numbers, you know, to police the various checkpoints, the various roadblocks, and the patrols vis-a-vis -vis the normal law enforcement uh, duties. But of all, I think it's done pretty well. Right. People say the security um, agencies, the law enforcers, are having a particularly difficult, you know, situation because the exemptions that's been granted appear to be the problem. People want to go and buy food, you are allowed. You want to go and buy you know, groceries, you want to go and buy medicine. You don't need to show anything. All you need is to tell the security officer that this is what you're going to do. Is there anything that can be done beyond that? Because some also suggest that in the extension, they had expected a tighter regime for the lockdown. There is a break, but if I heard you right, I would have expected that Immediately after the president's uh, remarks, is it three days ago, as we say in Akan, then in answer, there should have been another forum or another platform where the security agencies, as we did in the first instance, should have elaborated a new conceptual approach to the enforcement of the lockdown. It's not too late, but the earlier we did it, the better. Let me give you one example. For instance, I mentioned that the violations have been largely communal. And part of it derives from the way our market systems are set up. So if you take Kumasi Central Market, I lived in Kumasi many years ago, but for several years, who are the persons going to the central market to buy food? For instance, Kumasi Central Market, like many other central markets, are in logistical terms, bulk breaking points or wholesale. So the system of markets that we have itself poses a challenge to the enforcement, i.e. we don't have smaller markets that serve a smaller segment of society. And, and that, I think, is one of the challenges that have been faced both at Kumasi and at Kaswa and, and, and elsewhere. I mentioned the numbers. It's very obvious to me that if indeed, uh, according to Brigadier General Yusian uh, Abraham, that the Ghana Forces alone uh, has deployed in excess of 1,000, uh, that's on the lower side. I don't know how many the police have, have uh, deployed. But on the Sunday, the 5th of April, for instance, when I left my quarantine hotel, I got to ACP Junction. There was a checkpoint there. The checkpoint was manned by one single police officer. That obviously was not enough. At other places close to East Legon, I saw two police officers, three, uh, what do we call them? Um, those who wear the white shirts, the city wardens or city guards or something like that. So I think the, the numbers have been a challenge. And some communities have simply decided to violate 
you know, the regulation. I was told on phone that um, Pukwati, for instance, is as if nothing is happening. Mm. Uh, we've seen Kaswa, we've seen um, Malata Market, I think you showed it on your program, um, and so on and so forth. So in the kind of operation that DCOP Garba labeled as humanitarian, if you don't get the cooperation of the population, the citizenry, you might be forced now to resort to unnecessary use of force, mm. which in itself would be a backlash or could be a backlash. And I want to actually warn against that, that we're using the word recalcitrance, recalcitrance, recalcitrance. But there are reasons why persons are being recalcitrant. And if indeed we, they are pushed to the wall, it's possible that they might react. Mm. And when communities react, I think uh, we'll notice consequences, both in terms of the effort to fight this corona, as well as for national security uh, broadly. All right. Um, let's uh, hear the president and the finance minister and Professor Peter Corte, you tell us whether or not the economy can sustain what is going on. As part of measures to mitigate the effects of the pandemic, on the social and economic life of the country. I indicated in my last speech, the government will absorb water bills for all Ghanaians for the next three months, i.e. April, May, and June. Furthermore, water tankers, publicly and privately owned, are being mobilized to ensure the supply of water to vulnerable communities. We have decided on further measures of mitigation for all Ghanaians for the next three months, i.e. April, May, and June. Government will fully absorb electricity bills for the poorest of the poor, i.e. for all lifeline consumers. That is free electricity for persons who consume zero to 50 kilowatt hours a month for this period. In addition, for all other consumers, residential and commercial, government will absorb 50% of your electricity bill for this period using your March 2020 bill as your benchmark. For example, if your electricity bill was 100 CDs, you will pay only 50 CDs, with government absorbing the remaining 50 CDs. This is being done to support industry, enterprises, and the service sector in these difficult times, and to provide some relief to households for lost income. Nevertheless, I urge all Ghanaians to exercise discipline in their use of water and electricity. Mr. Speaker, the coronavirus alleviation program will primarily support provision of food and water for households and sanitation, to relief for health sector workers who are modern day protectors and soldiers against this unseen enemy, and three soft loans for micro, small and medium sized enterprises to alleviate the disruption of our business people, informal, who represent 90% of our employees, beyond the cold calculus of the economics. Mr. Speaker, consistent with Article 177, Clause 1 of the 1992 Constitution, I am by this presentation submitting a request to the Finance Committee to grant us the authorization to assess the requisite amounts from the contingency fund to confront the challenge that has engulfed the nation in this matter of the coronavirus COVID-19 affliction. Mr. Speaker, following this, the Ministry will take steps going forward to do the needful. Mr. Speaker, these are extraordinary and sobering times, and we must respond with a deep sense of social justice so that our very humanity is not compromised. Right, so Professor Peter Cote, is our economy capable of, you know, containing this situation? 
good from Facebook and to your uh, panelists and to your viewers as well. Uh, you, you ask a very interesting and difficult question, but um, I will try to address it. Is yes and no, yes, if um, we are able to contain this pandemic within the shortest possible time. Um, however, if we should go beyond, let's say, six months, uh, I think it's going to put a drain on our budget. Already, government has very limited fiscal space. And uh, if we look at how much is being given, especially, find that it's going to be a drain on the budget. But we are struggling to raise retention. Uh, so I'm not um, operating. Some are operating at very minimal threshold. And therefore, uh, we need to cut our foot according to our size. Um, I looked at what the finance minister presented, the 1.2 billion. I, I looked at some 280 million going to support us in terms of uh, food. Um, and and we, we also find health workers with the final Okay. All right. So, and water as well. And quite recently, we had the president also um, saying that our electricity bill for the next three months would be um, waived or will be paid for. About um, fifty percent of the bill will be taken over by government and for lifeline consumers. The entire amount. I think that that is a lot of money to give out there, and uh, it will be very interesting to look at our financial in this moment. What would you say? Be, you say beyond six months, but if it is within six months, after we have fought the pandemic, how will the economy look like? Well, uh, after the, you know, we talk about recession. Uh, recession normally occurs when you have um, consecutively uh, a decline in growth for two quarters. So um, roughly within six months, if we are able to contain it, uh, then that should be fine. Then we're not really going to a recession. Uh, we are likely to come out. And immediately the, after the, the uh, we've put this under control, the economy will start uh, aggressive production. And that comes to my point about this bailout that is going to be given to SFPs. Um, if that this is done very well, we look at, we assess them critically and look at the productive areas. There are some firms, no matter what you do in these times, they will not survive. There are some uh, in these times, they um, um, do not get the most out of it. But there are some companies, if, if you are really do the proper appraiser, credit appraiser, you will find that they are viable and, and those are the ones we should support so that actively get into production um, as soon as this, this monies are released and then as soon as we get out of the woods. If that is done, then um, even if we should go into some kind of recession, we will bounce back as quickly as uh, possible. We are looking at <clears throat> a bit of, <clears throat> sorry, the formalized sector. How about the majority, which is the informal sector? And what happens to the tomato seller who is perhaps because they are dealing in, you know, the food chain, they may still have some job, but everybody else will need some help. What should happen, even in the circumstances? Because you are very much right. The informal economy is about 80% of our total economy. So that is quite huge. Informal sector employs quite a greater proportion of our labor force. And therefore, if you just focus on the formal sector, uh, you will be making a mistake. You keep a lot of people out of business. Unfortunately for us, a lot of the informal sector workers or operators are not unionized, they are not registered. 
So trying to reach out to them becomes a bit of a problem. Uh, but I think um, we can still go ahead. Um, a quick way is to find a platform. Perhaps we can even use the National Board for Small Scale Industries. Um, if you go to their website, just like it's done in South Africa, they also have a similar organization where you are expected to register. So if the informal sector operator can register with the National Board for Small Scale Industries, or perhaps we can even use muscle law and existing systems to reach out to the informal sector. But um, these are not handouts that will, not, uh, will, be a, will be free money. But from what I hear, it has to be paid. So. Um, if you need to dish out money to any informal setup, it, uh, there should be some assessment or whatever activity they are doing, some evidence that yes, they actually engage in some meaningful uh, activity or economic activity, then uh, reach out to them. But we shouldn't limit it to just the formal setup. I also place an aspect I think we are overlooking uh, something. Um, there are some middle class or middle skilled or uh, highly skilled workers who have lost their jobs as a result of uh, this pandemic. You find the hotels, the restaurants, uh, most of them are either shut down or written at a very minimal level, 10%, 20%. You find teachers in private institutions who have lost their jobs. You find importers and exporters. Lots of our uh, traders go to China, uh, uh, Dubai and many other places to import and sell it to make a living. Why well, a number of these people have also lost their livelihood? Um, what do we do? I, I don't think we should leave them out. Um, I've always said that the UK, uh, for instance, guaranteed 80% of wage or salaries of private sector employees. In Ghana, we don't have the fiscal space to do that. But at least something to keep what we saw together um, in these times will be very useful mm. because within our limited budget space. Well, what do you say to those who suggest that electricity bills, for example, uh, lifeline users, you know, getting complete, you know, um, waiver assets where the government will absorb their consumption. Um, I think from what I understand, that is people who are consuming and paying in, in money terms, not more than, uh, is it uh, 20 Ghana CDs uh, in a month? That's 19 Ghana, 19 Ghana CDs or so. Um, that is okay to cushion the vulnerable because there are some of them who need to go to work each day before they can feed. What do you say to those who suggest that there is the other group, the middle class among others, who may have been able to, who have savings that they can, as it were, draw on. And therefore, the 50% um, is not something that government should have even contemplated because the electricity sector is already burdened with a lot of debt. Um, well, they may have a point there, but. But you see, um, I have seen a lot of people hail this policy. I think it's a, it's a good gesture. However, um, in other jurisdictions, in times like this, you get people to register. Uh, those that have, uh, have lost their jobs to register. Because in this wholesale uh, um, subsidy, those actively employed will get subsidy. There are those who are uh, taking their salaries. Nothing is happening to them. They take a subsidy. And there are those who have lost their jobs. And then, of course, you mentioned the lifeline uh, 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 beneficiaries. They basically work hand to mouth. But this lockdown, a lot of them are at home, actually. So it's not just about electricity. Um, when you look at the basic necessities of life, is food, water, and clothing. So if you pay my electricity bill, and uh, well, if I'm lucky and I'm able to go and uh, uh, join the queue, the crowd, and, and, and fight and get a pack of food, at least I've had food. But what about shelter? What about other things? Toiletries? So uh, I believe ideally, uh, if we could register, uh, get people to go online, and at least have some, some basic data, then we can target them a bit more mm. uh, or target them better.
we have failed in targeting and I think this will be the time to take up and ensure proper targeting. Okay. Um, we'd like to thank you very much, uh, Professor Peter Corte. Uh, unless you have a few words uh, extra and uh, any advice further as we go further, because there's an uh, expectation that we may even have a further extension after the one week, um, then we can you can take leave of us. Thank you. Uh, I think I would advise fellow Ghanaians to be law abiding. Um, this thing is for all of us. So if you have to stay at home, just stay at home. I find the market too crowded, and, and it, it worries me. I find people behaving as if there's nothing at stake. Uh, I mean, when I see, uh, not just if it, the, the, the masses, even on TV, you find people who are supposed to know better, uh, holding press conferences, doing all kinds of things, and it, it, there's no uh, social distancing. I think it's about time we take this very, very serious. Otherwise, uh, we will not be able to contain this uh, virus in a good time for us to turn our economy back. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so, Mr. Sebons, so what, what do you say particularly about the last bit that Professor uh, Peter Kote had to say about, you know, people's attitudes in complying to protect themselves and everybody else? Mm -hmm. So I think something, I mean, mainly I would say that I think Ghanaians are struggling to come to terms um, with the nature and character of this virulent virus that we have. And that is actually uh, telling. It seems to me that the message hasn't drowned or come home full horse. And so the, uh, in, in a certain sense, I mean, the horses aren't actually being reined in. I mean, and you could rightly see that one when you see exactly what is happening in our markets. So for example, I mean, at the very outset, you had uh, police deployment of roughly about 2,870 that were deployed. You had military deployment of about 2,200 that were deployed. As I speak, we have in excess of 8,000 policemen that are actually on the streets. And you also have more than 4,000 military personnel that are on the streets. The markets that we have are still mushrooming and still, how do you call it, becoming larger and larger. And so uh, the behavioral aspects of hum um, 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 human beings with respect to policy issues sometimes also take a, a, um, a turn that makes um, dealing with a particular problem sometimes much more problematic than it otherwise um, would have been. So that is the first thing that the security um, uh, establishment is actually grappling with and seem to put under caps. I heard, for example, um, I think it's Colonel um, Festo Sabuaji. Festo Sabuaji uh, allude to the fact that they need to go back, pick the plan, dust it, and perhaps see what more can be done. It's when you run an operation, and he knows it as well as I do that you keep on monitoring. In fact, when you push an operation into motion, you push into motion also a monitoring team. And so, by and large, your assessment is something that is quite um, fluid. I'll give you a typical example. So the very first day, for example, I mean, uh, from an operational perspective, was far too difficult and challenge. Because one, you didn't have the numbers required on the streets. You also didn't have the force structure on the street. You didn't have uh, uh, co uh, coordination issues were also there. But uh, subsequent to that, as there was a different. There was a sea change. You, a lot of reviews were done, assessments were quickly taken, and then you should also. We should also bear in mind that while all these things are going, normal law enforcement activities also. In, in hard currency. I mean, it's something that is going around. So, for example, around the country, I mean, these uh, uh, normal law enforcement issues, but the calm life operations are still going on. Mm. So, all these kinds of things uh, put a lot of strain on um, the existing resources that you find. You rightly said that you go to some and then you find that you don't have the full complement. Mm. I mean, uh, so, those kinds of things have been addressed. I think right. that in the fullness of time, we, we would have a wrap on those things, yes. Yes, so, Ms. Abochi, when you look at the security operation so far, what for you do you pick out to be the challenges and how do you think they can look at them? I, I, I look at uh, an aspect of it. I'm just reading how many people have been, you know, um, as it were, remanded. 
and I'm saying these are people outside and we have added them to the people inside. Um, what are we thinking about? What is going on? We are in uncharted terrain. We need to recognize that. There are so many things we have no answers to. Those in prison themselves, there are even questions about them. They were imprisoned and they were, they were, they were, they were imprisoned and kept in a particular place. Their freedom of movement is what was curtailed. They were not imprisoned to be exposed to danger. Mm. Therefore, those in prison maybe in principle have a claim to be released because there are allegations making the rounds that the virus may have entered the prisons. True or false, I don't know about that. But, you know, whatever it is, we are in uncharted terrain. Now, if we are in uncharted terrain, those at the helm of affairs may themselves, um, they themselves are confronting the difficulty of uncertainty, which we have. The least we can do is to cooperate. We should remember that the enforcement of the lockdown is not arbitrary. It is on the basis of law. There is uh, an imposition of restriction law that has been passed. Therefore, it's a requirement that people should stay at home pursuant to that imposition of restriction and pursuant to the executive instruments that have been passed in respect of that. Because we are in uncharted terrain, the Constitution itself, even the rights that are given to us, yeah. all these are dealing with that uncertainty, and it is our responsibility to cooperate. Um, look, we, we live in a constitutional era, and uh, with the Constitution, the Constitution doesn't contemplate that there can be police brutality, that you can have the military on the road and playing police roles, and also administering some level of uh, violence if there is at all, and all kinds of videos are making it. That is not true or false for me. That is not what I address at this stage. What I address is that cooperation is key and vital. And the idea mm. that citizens can unilaterally... Okay, uh, um, uh, you'll have to pause. I'll come back to you. I understand I have a little difficulty with your microphone. Uh, but this program is brought to you by the candidate sponsorship of MTN Everywhere You Go, Bank of Africa, as strong as a group. As close as a partner, Amen Scientific, God is the healer. Duraplast, where Duraplast goes, water flows. Kua FS, your immune booster. We lead, we build homes for you. And joy learning, keep learning. Uh, we will take a quick break and we'll adjust um, about his, um, you know, microphone and we come back to continue with the discussion on looking at the security uh, social and legal, you know, aspects of the measured lockdown, which has been extended by one more week. 